Well, good morning to everyone, and, and thank you, Anastasia, and everyone for your warm welcome. It's, it's an honor to join you, and I do bring you greetings uh, and love from my family in Merrill, Tennessee, and that's Maryville for you city slickers. Um, and so I just wonder, can you say Merrill? Uh, I can't Marvel. hear you, but I'm, yeah, good, good. Well, congratulations. Merrill. Genuine East Tennessee hillbillies. Welcome mm -hmm. to my family. Um, I also want to thank you for uh, sharing this morning uh, about what you would like, um, what, what makes you feel like a kid. And those were all amazing and wonderful and uplifting answers. And and while um, my story today um, is has has violence and tragedy involved in it and, and hatred, but it also has uh, goodness uh the good the the best you can see in humanity and and also the worst but and we're living in in very tragic times so i want you to know that i too stand with israel i love israel i've got lots of friends there and um i love all jewish people across the world and i'm grateful for my father's story which will tie in with even um the tragedy that we're dealing with but also the goodness that can come from it uh, today, I'll introduce you to heroes, ordinary people, just like you and me, who choose to live heroic. And some of the heroes you've never met, um, you'll meet today. Others, you really know very well. And I am absolutely convinced that an ordinary life lived well is, is extraordinary, even heroic. And I, I see lots of ordinary peeps here today, people who have the capacity to do the extraordinary. And if we were to spend time going over our own individual walks of life, we would we would experience some of the extraordinary ways that we help change people and make a difference. Because I believe one person can make all the difference. And that person is you in your neck of the woods. So say it with me, wherever you're at, I, I know I can't hear you, but just say, I can make a difference. Now think of a friend that's on this Zoom and say, you can, make a difference. Now, all together now, we can make a difference. Well, my story begins with an old diary, a weathered, fragile book. The diary belonged to a young man from Tennessee fighting for his country on a continent near the edge of collapse. His owner, my father, passed away years earlier. And since then, the diary remained tucked away with other mementos from his service in World War II. Like all our beloved veterans, Dad served with distinction. And I'm sure among us, there are veterans uh, with us today. And, and we have family members who may be active military. Well, I want to thank all of you for risking your life and dreams to serve us and our great nation so well. Because of you, we are safe and we are free. And we love you and we salute you. Master Sergeant Roddy Edmonds of the 106th Infantry was captured in the Battle of the Bulge, spent 100 harsh days in two German prisoner war camps. This was the story our family knew. To us, it was the totality of his service. Service he never talked about. While reading Dad's diary, years after his passing, his words moved my heart. In it, Dad wrote, a lot of things I'm not going to write because they're not exactly nice to talk about. I know God was with us and he answered our prayers. And then he said this very insightful and it's still true today. I learned men even better than before. Some were good, some were bad, some were better, some were worse. And God's spirit through dad's words inspired me to explore his service further, his time of service during World War II. So late one evening, just past midnight, I searched dad's name and rank on my computer. Remarkably, his name appeared in a New York Times article entitled Richard Nixon's Search for a New York Home. And the article recounted how an attorney named Lester Tanner sold his extort townhouse to the president in 1980. And in the article, Mr. Tanner mentioned the bravery of his master sergeant, Roddy Edmonds, saving his life. Oh, I'm stunned. That's my father. Who is Lester Tanner? And what does he mean by bravery? Is Mr. Tanner still alive? The questions just keep coming. And if so, where is he? 
So I began searching for Mr. Tanner and I searched and I searched several months go by. I finally find him still in New York City. Though he's retired, he's still practicing law for his larger clients. And uh, you just need to read the book because uh, this hillbilly and my wife and my grandson hillbilly, we all go to New York City, baby. And I'll tell you what, it is a it's a story within the story. Well, the day I met Lester, I learned the true story of my father's service. Dad was the highest ranking American soldier in style like Dine A, a POW camp for non-commissioned officers near Ziegenhain, Germany. It was near the end of the war, late January 1945. Even in the POW camps, the Nazis had strict anti-Jew policies and they segregated Jewish POWs from non-Jews, sending them to their certain death in murderous concentration camps. As a matter of fact, American Jewish soldiers were told by the army if they ever fell into enemy hands to destroy their dog tags, which denoted their faith with the letter H for Hebrew and never mentioned their Jewish identity. It was very dangerous for our Jewish brothers over there. And on the evening of January 26, the Germans sent orders to my father that only the Jewish Americans were to report for the next morning's roll call. Just the Jews, no one else. All who disobeyed would be shot. But without hesitation, my father turned to his men and he said, we're not doing that. Tomorrow morning, we all fall out. And he sent orders to the other four barracks to do the same. It was bitterly cold that morning, January 27, 1945. As the Nazi commander approached, he couldn't believe his eyes. All the Americans, nearly 1,300 soldiers were lined up in sharp formation. And we need to understand that many of those men had to be helped out there. They were in such bad shape, but they all went. That should speak volumes to us. The unity brought power and strength to their cause. Well, the German, a Major Siegmund, was angry. He's in charge of all POW camps. He's the eyes and ears of Hitler. He's, he, he's one person removed from it and reports to General Yodel. No one, and I repeat, no one has ever disobeyed his orders. Siegmund rushed over to my father. He gets up in his face and he screams, they can't all be Jews. To which my father declares, we are all Jews here. And then dad continues. Lester said, I was stunned with your father's bravery. He said, Major, under the Articles of the Convention, prisoners of, prisoners of war are only required to give name, rank, and serial. Don't quote regulations to me, screamed the Major. Were my orders not clear? I want the Jews, just the Jews. Well, standing on Dad's left was Sergeant Lester Tannenbaum, a.k.a. Lester Tanner. He's a 19-year-old Jewish kid from the Bronx whom Dad had trained since basic. He's one of dad's best soldiers. On dad's right was Sergeant Paul Stern, a combat medic from the 28th Division, another Jewish kid and fine soldier from the boroughs of New York. Ensuring eye contact, my father leans into the major and he says, Major, we'll give you name, rank, serial number. That's all. Well, dad's bravery swept through the ranks. The men stood a little taller. They were braver. But the Nazi turned blood red. Enraged, he lunged forward and pressed his pistol hard into my father's forehead. Sergeant, one last chance. You will order the Jews to step forward or I will shoot you right now. Well, by this point, Dad and his men had seen untold horrors. Brutal Battle of the Bulge where 89,000 American soldiers were killed, captured, or wounded, a death march of several days through deep snow and ice, no food, no water, no rest, no hope. Um, Sergeant Friedman told me, he said, if you didn't march, you didn't last. He heard shots ring out in the back. They were loaded on the boxcar, standing room only, pressed in to these boxcars which would comfortably hold 40 men. There were 80 to 100 American GIs pressed in there. No place to lay, 
no place to rest, no place to use the restroom. It was horrible. And they were locked in these boxcars and taken deeper into Germany, deeper and deeper and deeper. They were imprisoned in unmoxed boxcars and experienced a bombing while they were in those boxcars where 200 American GIs were killed during that bombing. They'd also experienced this time 40 days of starvation where the men were losing on average a pound a day. They were miserable, haunted by lice and dysentery and trench foot, forever hungry, forever cold. And just two days earlier from this moment with the gun to my father's forehead, dad and his brave boys were forced to watch the savage execution of a young Russian soldier and threatened the same would happen to them if they had disobeyed Nazi orders. Dad had been shot, interrogated, beaten, kicked, smashed with rifle butts, bitten by dogs, stripped of his dignity. And the only word he would ever share with me when I'd ask as a teenager, Dad, what happened over there? He'd just say, son, we were humiliated. Humiliated. Maybe that's why Dad wrote, no one can realize the horrors an infantry soldier goes through. You get scared. And I mean scared. And so we must understand that dad and all of his men were scared to death. Yet their dad stood strong, brave, resolute. Lester told me, Chris, your father, he never wavered. I wonder if dad was recalling a favorite scripture of his. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Then suddenly dad spoke calmly, courageously. And once again, he leaned into the major, ensuring eye contact. Major, you can shoot me, but you'll have to kill all of us because we know who you are. And you'll be a war criminal when we win this war. And you will pay. Well, Zygmunt, according to Lester, turned white. And his arm began to tremble, holding the gun that was pressed to Dad's forehead. Time froze. No movement. No sounds, just the smoke like puffs of breath rising skyward, along with lots of prayers. Recently, I stood where dad looked evil in the eye and dared a Nazi to shoot. Thanks to the generosity of the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous, I traveled to Europe with a film crew to follow the footsteps of my father. Via the miracle cinema, I want us to hear more of the story and the rest of the story from some of the heroes, the Jewish heroes who were there with him. I was 26 years old. You know, my father, he never really talked about his experiences in World War II or his time as a prisoner of war. He would say, son, there's some things I'd rather not talk about. While my father was a prisoner of war, he kept a diary. The late one night after reading his diary, I Googled his name and rank, and the first link that came up was an article in the New York Times. I was being interviewed by the New York Times in 2008. All of a sudden, I remembered that there was a master sergeant, Roddy Edmonds, who saved my life when he defied the Germans and POW camp. That's all I said. In the middle of that article, Lester mentions the bravery and courage of his master sergeant, Roddy Edmonds. And I said, I got to find out what really happened to my dad during his PLW experience. I was born in the Bronx on August 8, 1923. January 27, 1924. I was born in Cleveland on April 24, 1924. June 17, 1925, in Brooklyn, New York. I got the draft notice shortly after I turned 18, and I reported in for the draft exam, and they found me totally acceptable. I was breathing. I was 18 years old. I was assigned as a combat medic to care for the wounded soldiers on the battlefield. I was in headquarters company of the 422nd Infantry Regiment of the 106th Division. And that's where I met Les Tanner. And I was Sergeant Lester Tannenbaum of the headquarters company. And Roddy Edmonds was the master sergeant. Roddy grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee, 
he probably never met a Jew in Tennessee when he went into the army. My dog tag had the information on it, my name and my serial number, and the letter H for Hebrew, so that if they found our bodies, they would know how to bury us. One of the things we were told that if we were captured, we should destroy our dog tags. Because being a Jew in that circumstance, we didn't know what our future was. And off we went to the front. We went over as replacements for filling up the slots that had been opened by casualties. It was December, it was snowy, it was the coldest winter in 50 years. We replaced the second division on the front, right in the Siegfried line, on the German side of the border. We were very vulnerable. The men had come and were told that this was a quiet sector. And when they got here, just six days after they got here, uh, the war came to them. The first day of the attack was December 16th. I awakened and heard shell fire. St. Fifth was being attacked. That's our division headquarters 10 miles in back of us. We were there when the Germans broke through with the Battle of the Bulge, and they broke through in force. They broke through north of us and south of us. We were completely surrounded, and we knew we were cut off. Our position was untenable, and we finally decided to make a break for it. And we are cut off and surrounded by columns of German tanks, guns, troops. Captain Forster said, it's hopeless. I'm reading from my father's diary that he kept. It was a hopeless cause in our case. When Captain Foster surrendered us, he did a very wise thing. Our rifles were no good against tanks and 88 fire. And out we came to become part of what was the largest collection of captured GIs in World War II, from the 106th, from the 28th, and others. We began to start our march to we didn't know where. There was a concern that the Germans would just shoot us up. When you're in brutal hands, like the Germans were, you're scared as hell. I particularly was concerned because my name was obviously Jewish. And then we got to the railhead, Gerald Stein. They loaded us on boxcars. We were packed like sardines in that boxcar. No food or water on the four-day trip to Bad Orem. So the boxcars we were in turned out to be exactly the same cars that were taking the Jews to concentration camps. And we went further into Germany. Boarded train, Thursday, 21, December, 44. Arrived Stalag 9B, Bad Orb. Monday, 25, December 44. Registered Tuesday, 26, December 44. We had to register. Name, rank, serial number. But then they started asking questions about your religion. The Germans segregated the Jewish POWs. And we were assigned to the Jewish barracks. A special barracks surrounded by barbed wire within the prison. We were in a prison within the prison. The order came down one day that the non-commissioned officers were getting on trucks and were being taken to an another camp. They took all the sergeants and corporals, all the non-commissioned officers, whether they were Jewish or not. And luckily, I am taken out of that isolated place at Bad Orb, and the next thing I know, I'm on a train going to Ziegenheim. The Jewish POWs who had been left behind were shipped to a slave labor camp. All of them later were sent to Berger, and many of them died there. Arrived Stalag 9A, Friday, 26, January 45. I'm walking along Main Street of Stalag 9A, Ziegenhain. People are living here even today. It's, it's really hard to imagine that, that these barracks still stand almost intact the way that they were when Dad and his men were here. British were there, French were there, Russians were there, and now we were coming in to occupy a quadrant of that whole thing. 
capture about 1,200 American prisoners. Of the 1,200, I would estimate maybe 200 were Jewish. In Singenheim, in my barracks, Lester was in it, Paul was in it, Roddy was in it. So there's about 240 men in the barracks. You were given one thin blanket. That was all you had. You went to bed hungry. You got up hungry. You were hungry forever. Dinner was a piece of bread. We had 10 men sharing one loaf of ersatz bread. So it was probably half flour and half sawdust. I lost 60 pounds in three months. It was January 27, 1945, when the Germans announced that all Jewish American prisoners would fall out the following morning, just them. Anyone who didn't fall out would be shot. Same thing that they had said at Bad Oil. Roddy, for the first time in his experience, was in complete command. There was no one there to give him orders. It was his decision. He said, we're not going to do that. Everyone is going to fall out, just as we do every morning. And that following morning, Roddy is standing at the head of formation, and I was standing by his side. I was there, the German was there, and Lester was there. So I heard every word that the commandant said. Major Siegmann comes up to Roddy, and he says, you can't all be Jews. And Roddy said, we are all Jews. That famous line, we're all Jews here, that will live in Jewish history. Takes out his luga and puts it next to Roddy's forehead, and he says, you will order the Jews to step forward, or I will shoot you right now. And Roddy said to him, Major, you can shoot me, you can shoot all of us, but we know who you are, and this war is almost over and you'll be a war criminal. And with that, the Major lowered his Luger, about face, went back to his headquarters. We were able to track the war pretty closely, even as we were POWs. So we knew we were within days of being liberated, hopefully. The German commanders informed Roddy that they were going to evacuate the camp. They don't want to be around when the Americans come. And under Roddy's leadership, we refused. And that's why I'm here to tell you about the story today. Roddy said, we're just too weak to go on a long march. We were in such lousy shape. The chances of coming out of that alive are not good. Nobody marches out of camp. You break ranks and you run back into the barracks. And you keep doing that all day. The day dawns, and in come the Germans. House, house! Rouse, getting up, going back and forth. We can see the British are moving out. Everybody else is moving out. We're still standing there. Finally, they give up, the Germans. And the German officers came up to Roddy and... Sorry, I have a little bit of a glitch here. We'll see if we can get it back on track right at the exciting moment. Ziegenheim. Bearing one loaf of Ersatz bread. So it was probably half to give him all. Moving out. Everybody else is moving out. We're still standing there. Finally, they give up, the Germans. And the German officers came up to Roddy and said, OK, <laughs> camp is yours. And they marched out. We were left alone in the camp. It gets very quiet. So now I climb up, a few of us climb up on the roof of our barracks, and then we see two lines of tanks. We were liberated on March 30th by an American armored group. The 6th Armored Division, as it turns out. They were amazed to see these American soldiers 
thin, hungry. So it was such a happy day. We were liberated on March 30th, which was the second day of Passover. And every time I ran a Seder, I would make this point because it was the date of my freedom. I've made new friends and lost some. I don't know whether all my boys are alive or not, but I pray that they are. It all seems sort of a bad dream. Well, they took us to Camp Lucky Strike, and I lost track of Roddy. And uh, I, I never saw him again after, after that day. And, but it was never out of my mind. I have to tell you, that experience and Roddy uh, was a defining experience in my life. Roddy was incredible. He never really got his recognition except among us. We were very lucky to have him with us. That such people can exist gives you hope maybe for humanity. We stood there, we were the witnesses. We were the witnesses. I've been following the footsteps of my father, and it's led me here. The lives of 200 Jewish men were forever changed right here. It wasn't only my life. Our lives multiplied. I have four children. I have six grandchildren. I have two great-grandchildren. So I would I have 18 people that wouldn't be here without him. Multiply that by 200, and you can see how important that decision has been. That's the biggest joy for me, is to see the real people, the lives that have been touched and changed. Roddy could no more have turned over any of his men to the Nazis than he could stop breathing. It just couldn't do it. A righteous man. I want to thank the um, Jewish Foundation for the Righteous uh, for that wonderful uh, documentary. Now, I'll, I'll tell you where you can find that later. Uh, in 2016, Yad Vashem, the world's Holocaust authority, honored my father as righteous among the nations. As many of you know, it's the highest honor given by the nation of Israel to non-Jews who risked their lives to protect Jews during the Holocaust. The historic ceremony was hosted by Ambassador Ron Dermer at the Israeli Embassy in Washington, D.C. for the first time ever. Uh, in attendance were a host of dignitaries, including uh, movie maker St Steven Spielberg and special guest President Obama. Uh, and for the first time ever, a sitting president came to visit the embassy. Even Prime Minister Netanyahu Skyped in live from Jerusalem to honor my father. Uh, Dad is only the fifth American and the first U.S. soldier named as righteous. And he's the first of the righteous who saved American Jews. I also like to add he's the first Tennessean uh, to be named righteous. It was a remarkable evening. And I hope the next remarkable e ceremony will be um, at the White House to present Dad the Medal of Honor. Um, Dad is also being considered for the Congressional Gold Medal. And I, I think he deserves both. And I, I, how about you? I, I hope you do too. Well, my family and I are very blessed to know Dad's story. And obviously we love him even more. But our greatest blessings has been meeting some of the men and families Dad saved that you saw in the video. Uh, Sonny Fox of California, Lester Tanner of New York, Paul Stern of Virginia, Henry Hank Friedman of Georgia, who wasn't in the film, and Skip Friedman of Cleveland, Ohio. All these men I met since 2013. Sadly, all of these men have passed away. Lester most recently in January 
of this past year. And Dad's legacy are these men and all 1,292 American soldiers he helped rescue, including their children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and generations to come. Um, Lester calculated for me one day, he asked, do you know how many people are, are alive because of your dad's actions? And I said, well, I, probably two or 3,000. And he said, no, there was more than 13,000 people alive and well today because of what he did for us in that camp. Um, so what lesson can we learn from dad while there are many? Uh, I'd like for us to focus on the, the lesson of greater love. One of dad's favorite scriptures was greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. He loved that scripture, but he also lived that scripture. Um, he wasn't perfect, but he did his best to serve God and humanity and all that he did. Do you recall how Lester described dad's greater love at the end of the film? His love for God and humanity he said Roddy could no more have turned over any of his men to the Nazis than he could stop breathing. He just couldn't do it a righteous man. And when Lester saw dad stand up to evil with selfless love, he committed to do the same through the rest of his life, to choose what's right for others, regard, regardless of the risk, regardless of the circumstances, and regardless of the cost. You and I can do the same. As in, in this day and age, we must do the same. So if you ask dad why he did it, most likely it's say, what's all the fuss? I posed the enemy. I protected my men. I honored my God. I was just doing my job. Well, President Obama said, I know your dad said he was just doing his job, but he went above and beyond the call of duty. I cannot imagine a greater expression of Christianity than to say, I too am a Jew. So why did dad do it? It was the right thing to do. It's right for God and right for humanity. And he knew it was the right thing to do because of his love from the good Lord above and the truth. He learned from the good book. You see, dad fought evil of the worst kind with deeply held moral convictions. I call Roddy's code. He tells God he opposed evil. He dignified life. He loved everybody, even that old Nazi major. Dad loved him by telling him the truth, the hard, cold facts of the truth. Dr. Martin Luther King proclaimed, I believe that unconditional, uh, that unarmed truth and unconditional love well, had the final word. Well, love had the final word for dad and his men in that camp. And love must have the final word for us in our society. And so as I uh, get ready to uh, let you ask questions, I just want you to understand that obviously we're well aware, even with this past weekend's tragedies and, and, and the savagery of humanity towards uh, the goodness of humanity. Anti-Semitism, hatred of every kind has not gone away. In fact, it's growing. And it's evil. But greater love is more powerful. It's the cure and hatred that's found in all of us. Your ordinary life lived well is extraordinary, even heroic. You see, your life matters and it matters most when you love others greater than yourself. The Talmud teaches the same. He, he who saves one life saves the entire world. So let's leave here today to save our world in your neck of the woods through one kind word, one good deed one loving action, one precious life at a time. When I speak to young people, I end with a song. I'm going to end with that today. I'm only one call away. I'll be there to save the day. Superman's got nothing on me. I'm only one call away. So I hope you will say it with me. I will make a difference. Tell your friends you will make a difference, and all together we will make a difference. Be the hero. Now, I'll take um, questions and uh, from you guys, and I want to refer you to my book. It's it's right here. Um, the, the, the entire story is phenomenal, and you learn about the heroes, not only Dad, but the other heroes who are there, which will inspire you to be the heroes that you know very well. And also go to my website. There's lots of information there, lots of links. The president's on there. Uh, Prime Minister Nathan News on there. RoddyEdmonds.com. Uh, you'll learn more about the, the, the Jewish heroes who were there with Dad. Um, so questions?